The spelling of my last name is M-A-R-T-Y-N-I-U-K, pronounced Martinuk. First name Terry. Yeah, I know that's important for you. Uh, why is that? It's something I've, um, I've had shame around growing up. Having a name that was difficult to pronounce. Why, why would that say about your identity? Mm, I think it spoke a lot about how I valued myself in the world. And how others. Right, right. But if I can't own it, if I can't own the name, the strength of my name and my culture, then, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the complicated story. Mm -hmm. But now you're 61 and... Um... How do you, what relationship do you have with your identity now? Well, I've reclaimed a lot. In fact, just by claiming my name in such a, such a way, I'm putting myself into the world. Um, and I, it's, I think I will be reclaiming myself for the rest of my life. Owning my voice, owning my opinion. Mm -hmm. So in the remainder of your life, what type of methods do you have in mind for reclaiming the part of your mm, identity? Probably, you know, probably speaking up more than I normally would. The value that, to value what, I, what I'm thinking of, if, if my opinion is asked for, or I'm displeased with something, to not just um, suck it up or, or not say anything about it, but to declare something for myself. Mm. And I could be wrong. Mm. You know? Or it may not get fixed or changed, but at least I would have had my voice heard. But are those feelings from today or are those leftover feelings from... They're, they're definitely leftover feelings. They're the past. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, you, hear, you hear people talk about just, you know, leaving stuff behind them. You know, like things from the past, right. you know, maybe not dwell on it too much. Right. Um, in, with this particular topic, it seems that you're saying like, no, I'm going to look into this. Yeah, I'm going to, because I think there's, for me, I've learned there's something, there's important, there's something important that I'm, I'm not um, giving it the attention it needs. So if, so, you know, um, it, and also, it also keeps like, if I'm holding a belief about myself that I'm not worthy or I'm, I'm not worth the attention or the time or the effort, then that permeates my whole life. I mean, there's, what can I, that's how I present in the world, as timid, mm -hmm. as easy, you know, as, as uh, I'm, I might come across as a nice guy, but is it serving me? Mm -hmm. Generally, it doesn't. And what would change in life when you have finally mastered this? I don't think, think there will ever be a point where I'll master it, but it's, it's, it's going to be an ongoing progression towards being more honest mm -hmm. and showing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the risks inherent in that. Some of may say, you know, you're a bother. Get lost. Mm -hmm. Or your opinion, I, don't, I, don't, I, I disagree with you. Or that's stupid. Or why would you, you know, why are you having this reaction? And th that's all a part of it. Now for a topic like this, um Is there something you can do in a men's group specifically well that you wouldn't be able to do on your own with your spouse, with a psycho normal psychotherapist? I mean, I don't know if it's exclusive to a men's group, but I find a men's group is a perfect laboratory to try things out. If it's built, if it's got some good, if it's got good principles, confidentiality and... Um, I mean, whatever, whatever those might be to make you feel safe. Mm -hmm. That's the place where you can, you can really t kick the tires, test the waters, and see, you know, see what the reaction will be and see how, how well or not your, uh, it lands, mm -hmm. you're accepted. Mm -hmm. What surprises me is when I see men share in a, in a, in a men's group and, it, and you get a sense it's, re, it's something really risky for them. It's something they haven't told anybody or they're ashamed of it and they really want to put it out there. Uh, when they get the resonance back where if you would inquire and say, well, 
he just said something that was pretty risky and, you know, something personal. Does, does anybody relate to this? And you see the majority of hands go up. That's that sort of breaking the isolation that we think of ourselves as I'm the only one who thinks this way or has these opinions. And when you see other men are like, you know, have, can identify with it, it, it validates your, your being. Now, are men's groups environments that are just very disarming? Or is it the normal man in the street that we maybe not trust? So I have to add, I'm a little confused by the question. Well, we, we're concluding that men's group is a, is a good environment to, to face our, our fear, our vulnerability. Um, but why does that work so well in a, in, a, in a dedicated men's group where men are willing to open up? I mean, does it say something about what men's groups are or does it say something about what's missing with the normal man in the street? It's a complicated question. I think, it, I think both. Um, I think it's difficult to talk about, you know, that there's a general consensus. Because I think from my, my limited experience with men's group is that they all come in different flavors. There's different, different tenants to each of the groups. They're, they're, um, they may even have a different purpose. Mm -hmm. Some may challenge, some may just support. Some may be dropping. I mean, so it's hard to sort of say, to speak of men's groups in, in, in a general term as men who gather, but what the um, mission statement or the purpose of that group is, I think is vast and varied. Some are, some are very religious. Some come and practice the faith together as men. Other are more support, support groups um, with, a, with a specific purpose. Men who love to hunt may want to gather and 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 have that tribal uh, fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you and I have been in two, two different groups together. Um, at the first, I think in, in, the, in the year that I was part of that, I think I was the only one that ever cried. Last week, in our group, four men were in tears. Do you have a, an explanation for this contrast? And we're looking at the different cultures. Right. Oh, you're talking about the two different groups. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and I think it all comes down to... You mentioned culture. And so culture is an, it's one of the factors. There's a lot, I think there's a lot of complexity in, in men's groups. And by that I mean if you have uh, men of different cultures attending, those cultures have a normative state. And so um, that will influence how a man shows up. The two, the, the two basic type of cultures is we are in a North American culture that is fairly individualistic. And uh, other parts of the world, like particularly Asia, it's a much more of a collectivist culture and so they come with different, their values are quite, quite different. And that's going to manifest in a men's group where an, individu an individualistic culture, a man would, would say, you piss me off. There's things that, you know, you would put the blame on somebody else. Whereas uh, another way of doing it is, is taking res pers personal responsibility for their um, discomfort or, or bother and make, and make gentle inquiry and then apologize or see what part they may play. So it's, that, I mean, there's, there's so many variables. I think safety is important. I mean, if a man can feel he'll be heard and not shamed or told to grow up or be a tough guy, that will welcome more emotional expression. I think it's, it's difficult to find, um, with the competitive nature of the workplace, uh, for men, I think I think that it's more we tend to not show that vulnerable side because it shows it's interpreted as weakness. When for me, it's actually I can see a man cry. I, I see great strength there in 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 being in touch with his in, internal workings. Okay, so why did that not work in the first group? 
which for the record you left and I'm leaving too. Right. So right. something didn't work. Something didn't work, yeah. I, that was um, my second men's group that I, that, well, it was a, the first official men's group that I, I walked into without, without, not, without knowing the culture. So over time I began to realize it's sort of a mythopoetic culture that goes back, you know, 20 so, or 30 years um, in the Vancouver area. And I've always found there's, there's conflicting views because um, when I first joined, four words were, were put on a table and that they were the four considered primary feelings, happy, sad, glad and angry or something like that. And, uh, and the way that the group was run, it was like, we can talk about these. But there really wasn't, um, there was inquiry to like, well, you, know, you just shared something, but what were you feeling? And that was when I first joined the group. There was inquiry to, well, but what are you feeling? And you can talk about it. As opposed to, well, if you're feeling something, what, what do you need here? You know, if you're feeling sad, what, how can we support you in really having that, that feeling fully? And that wasn't the case. It was like, sometimes it was following a clock, sometimes the talking stick, which was, a, was an integral part of the, of, the, uh, of the sharing, didn't allow for crosstalk at that point. So the man who had the stick, we were honoring his presence there and, and uh, his need to tell what need to be told, you know, to be spoke, to be heard from. So I, I, don't, I think the structure wasn't set up where that kind of inquiry was um, was welcomed or, or even um, considered. Is that the only complaint you have about the talking stick? I, I think the talking stick serves a good serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, in a competitive society where where people, you know, have to raise their voices and 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 sort of be more. Um, disruptive in being heard and talking over each other and interrupting and not not properly listening I think the talking stick facilitates deeper listening because we know what the protocol is he has a stick I'll be quiet and listen I can zone out but I won't interrupt him another difference uh, between these two groups is that the second group is younger mm -hmm. what um, what can young fellows bring that uh, seniors can't? Well, I think that the life experiences are quite different. Their histories are different. When they grew up, I think values may have changed somewhat. Um, I think the younger generation is exposed to so much more now. Mm. So I think they have a, the ability to research and, and find out more information that was wasn't as, wasn't as readily available for my generation. Mm -hmm. And that just informs you differently. So, you know, you read, you know, go, go to YouTube and catch some of the TED Talks and they're, they can open up a lot. Here's my phone. Um, of the various groups type that there are, I think your, your preference is a process group, right? Yeah. And, and off process groups, I think you want to go quite deep. Yeah. And now. Well, personally, I want to go deep. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, I don't expect that from, I think, I think in order to maintain an environment for men to feel comfortable, they, you, you have to go at the pace of the group. You have to go at the pace of the group. It's, it, you, you can't, I think it's dangerous to force somebody to have something they're not willing to have. Mm -hmm. I think you can open up an opportunity to be curious and, you know, if they come back week after week with something about a person, you are you willing to follow it and see what's underneath that? Mm -hmm. Now, let's say you're, you're in a group, either a men's group or you're running a workshop and you're, you're doing a one-on-one -on -one interaction with one of the men there. What is the value of having the other man present? So a number of things. Um, one is that there's, there's support. There's support for both men to be held in, uh, it, seeing it sort of validates the sacredness of the container and that this man can be supported by other men in whatever way he needs. He might say, go away, like, 
you know, don't be here. And, that, and, the, and the group can do that as well. Or, or he can feel challenged by the group. And if he's curious enough, I mean, generally, my experience is when, when men are in a group and they develop sort of a sense of safety because as they get to know everybody's history and the men, and the men personally, then you, you, you become to trust and uh, I think it, it opens up where you can go deeper in your process knowing that you won't be shamed or uh, be misunderstood or be, you know, be just like discarded, like, oh, you're just, you're damaged goods or whatever. But I think uh, the group container also, the wisdom of the group is there. So occasionally I'll, if a man's working on something and, and the group is there and you can feel the energy I can feel I am really get in touch with what's feeling here a lot of times a man on the outside if you say what are you feeling here because we're, we're in this we're in this collective energy field and don't think that what you're feeling is is not important like I, what are you feeling right now and if he goes oh I feel sadness and then you can sort of say, is anybody else feeling that and even if no one else is, you can claim there's sadness here as we watch this man struggle with something. And another man might say, I'm bored. This is bullshit. This is taking too much time. That's valid too. There's, there's, there's um, um, frustration. So you begin to solicit and then you realize it's like all of that can be present. It's a part of it. It's how, what you're feeling doesn't have to be, you know, we all, it's, it rarely is where everybody feels the same kind of feeling, but these are valuable. These are valuable insights, so that it's information you can bring. The man will hear and go, you know, does that mean anything to you? He's he's feeling um, frustrated and he's feeling sad, and uh, and you see where it goes. So it's essential that everyone feel, everyone is participating, whether they think they are or not. They're within this collective energy field. They're hearing the same things, they're experiencing it, but what's going on inside for them is of value to the overall process. Now, what if those outsiders, the bystanders, so to say, were women? Yeah, their value, I, I, I mean, I, I work with mixed groups as well. Um, equally as valid. Valid, yeah, but... The last two workshops that you did were with men only, so there was a reason for that. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, I, my experience with men's group shows me that there's there's um, a unique flavor to men gathering. And um, speaking with men, some men feel safer, especially if, if there's issues, they have issues with women. And most of us have a mother wound somewhere that we feel where we, you know, women won't understand. Sometimes we have to use language that could feel, uh, they maybe feel threatened with using this type of language with a woman around. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all familiar with, with what damage man can do to others. What damage can man do to himself? Can you give me an example? Well, for example, you can neglect your, what you just said about the, the issue with your mother. You can neglect it and thereby at least you're not nurturing an important part of yourself. So what, what you know, we're, we're both in men's groups, so we probably agree that this is good for oneself. It might be good for society. So I just also want to, to, to make the contrast a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, what 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 is the damage if one uh, doesn't or is is it virtuous at all to to work on oneself? Um, what what happens if someone neglects his personal development? I don't really understand the question. No. no. Okay. Well. The initial phrasing was, what damage can man do to himself? So, an alcoholic does damage to himself. Right. right. Okay. So, that's, that's a substance abuse, but your field is more the emotional welfare of individuals. Yeah. Well, um, so I'm just going to follow a train of thought here. So, 
the theory behind the work with core energetics um, is that in our past there's been a wound or a trauma where we've either um, there's either been um, sometimes referred to as a coax where there's a sins of omission or sins of commission something's been done to us that shouldn't have been or we never received something that was needed so we end up we, we take this information as a very young being and um, generally we can turn it on ourselves to go well gee if if I didn't get something, if my mother wasn't there when I needed her repeatedly or I wasn't getting nurtured in certain ways, it informs me I'm not worthy or I'm, le- you know, I'm not um, important enough or significant enough. Um, when it happens at a young age, um, in order for us to survive, we have to sort of come up with a strategy, a way of de- defending ourselves. And so we usually um, decide to, we, 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 we may make the decision that I don't matter, therefore I'm insignificant. And so I'm going to fly into the radar. My voice doesn't, my opinion doesn't matter. I don't count. I'm, um, I'm not like the rest of, you know, I, don't, I see other people being, getting things, their needs met. I don't get mine met. So it tends to inform me that I'm flawed or I'm, I'm less significant. And that can really, um, it's like the, kind, the, the, the type of lens that you see the world through. And so that, that, that wound needs to go back and be healed. And in order to heal it, I think you need to have the full expression of, of fighting for yourself. That, you know, to have the rage about why, wasn't, why didn't you come for me? Why didn't I get, why, weren't you, why couldn't I get what I needed? And then the, the heartbreak of, of acknowledging that it did hurt. It, it hurt me. I was hurt. And I was lost. I didn't know what to do. I felt insignificant. And then claiming yourself back to go, I have a right to be here. That should have been done. There were circumstances beyond my control, a war, a war or a famine or an unwanted pregnancy or a, breaking, a marriage that was falling apart or a single, a single parent or whatever. A, a myriad of events could have led to that happening, really to, to no fault of the parent, but that's what happens to the child. And so you have to reclaim yourself. And this is what this work does. It gets to the, gets to the original wound, and then you go through the stages of reclaiming yourself and, and, and honoring yourself as a human being. And what have these insights um, done for you? How has it helped you? Well, I've, I've, it's excited me to, uh, to do the work, uh, to, 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 be, to do a men's workshop. That was something I, I didn't think it was possible two years ago. I, I didn't have the knowledge, a, 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 um, a launch pad, sort of a, a skill level or a template in which to sort of um, operate from. And um, it's, given me, it's given me more compassion when I see people struggling where I would normally blame somebody. Like, you know, I, I, would, I would quickly judge, uh, judgmental, like, get over it or, you know, pull, pull your stuff up by the bootstraps or what's wrong with him? Why, why does this, you know, why? Well, and you realize it's, it could be a very early wound that that is running this person. That's how they came into the world. That's how they've been in the world. And they need to switch back and, and maybe find the, you know, where that lens came in, where that filter came in that informed them of something about themselves that isn't true. Mm-hmm. Okay, but are you willing to, on camera, talk about one of your own wounds that these insights really helped you with? Yeah, let me think. So what I, um, in my particular wounding I had, I'm a, I'm a middle child of five children. My parents had five kids. And um, I know that when I came into the world, I was... Um, I had, I had, um, I've been informed that I've had trauma in, in the birth. The birth was a very difficult birth for my mother and for myself. And I wasn't um, a very happy baby. And I know for a fact that my mother, in stories that she was so frustrated, all she could do was put me in a room and close the door and get some respite. I, I don't, I mean, and, and knowing the fact that she probably didn't have the support she needed, she was exhausted, yada, yada, all the, all the things that, Go, go around with that. Um, a part of me, in, 
still probably, probably still thinks in that, that I don't have the worth to be really acknowledged as my presence matters, that I have a life purpose that is meaningful or I have, I have a, um, goals to attain or... So I've been informed in that way where um, yeah, I have felt just it, it, insignificant. And I've had, to claim, I've had to claim myself back. And I continue to do so. I think it's going to be my lifelong, you know, it's going to be a lifelong journey. Uh, I began to busk, you know, to, to put myself out there with, in music, show up in public and play. And as a musician, yeah, like writing songs or being out there with your talent and being judged and knowing that well, you can say whatever you want. And I have a belief about myself. I'm a good person. Hmm. I'm creative, resourceful, and I have, a, I have a, a reason to be. If you would do a workshop with 14-year-olds and you see that some of these young men have similar feelings, how would you conduct that workshop? Well, I probably wouldn't do it with 14-year-olds. I would actually um, inform to actually, you know, make sure they're an adult. So they'd probably be at least, you know, the age of majority, early 20s or even better. Okay, fine. A group of men in their early 20s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would it go about? Would it be different than if it would be late well, 30s? I, I, you know, I think, I mean, the principles are the same. I mean, really, what, what's going on? Where are you in life? How, how are you feeling about things? It's, um, so what I've learned is the language of feelings. I was very numb to what my inner world was telling me. Mm. Um, so even, even with the Knights Without Armor, when those four words would go out there, that would be an anchor point. I could go, oh, this past week, have I been angry? Have I been sad? Have I been, you know, so, so it's really you, um, and I, I find uh, younger people in my experience, um, are more emotionally literate, where they can identify. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can't say across the board, but the young man I've been uh, that I have in my life and I've been exposed to, like, are much further along than I was at their age. Mm -hmm. I was still like into the macho stuff, like you don't show this because it's a sign of weakness. And I think they're coming out into the world, going, "Oh, I feel this way. I can cry." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think I think they come from a there's. From my experience, they're more advanced in that way where they can maybe recognize some of their emotions. That doesn't mean that, that they're, they're not numb to other, other parts of themselves. Well, in the last two weeks, have you felt angry, sad, glad, mad? Yes. What All happened? Other. What happened with that? Um, I, could, I could actually recognize and name the feeling rather than uh, discard it. Um, my wife was also in the work that I do. We do sessions together. So I did a lot, of, I had to do a lot of shaking. I thought I, I um, would lay on, lay on a foam mat and just have a, ta it was literally having a tantrum mm -hmm. in a crib where I was moving every part of my body, my arms and legs, and just using my voice. And I could feel that energy just go through me. It was, there was a lot of frustration there. Mm -hmm. And underneath that was heartbreak, as it were. And so that, just, that was some, something that came out for me. And your wife was present? Yes. Was that a lonely moment, or was it a moment when you felt very connected? It was, um, I mean, we've been doing this work for over 20 years together. Uh, like having doing counseling each other and things, so I really feel safe with her. Um, was I lonely? There, there was there was the feelings and the heartbreak of being young and alone. There, I wasn't lo alone in the room. I felt tremendous support in just being able to to not be misunderstood in having, you know, an adult tantrum. And afterwards, it, I, I had tears. And I, something lifted, something had, energy had moved through me, so I had clarity. 
So I'm just about to uh, go to LA and um, report on how my projects went to the, to the community, to the school. And um, uh, so the first workshop I did with you back in June um, was six, over six months ago or so. And um, I'd taken notes and I did a bit, bit of a journal. And of course, so like nobody gets identified. It's just what was my experience putting on a, a men's and why? And why did I choose to do men's, right? So I'm having to come up with all the, all the reasons why I decided to do that. And um, and I've learned, I've learned an awful lot. And what I've learned about this work is, um, this is, this is Terry speaking, it, it is much needed. I see men doing men's work and women's doing women's work and couples doing couples work and men and women doing mixed work is, is all important and it all comes in, you know, as, as, as complex as we are as humans, you can have a group of Asians, you know, I mean, you can just go on. Um, but I, I get a sense that there's a real thirst and, and um, I hear it when men share. There's so much, uh, I guess I've really found that my, my ability to listen has improved greatly because when men share, I, I, get what, I get an energetic bump and I know, one, because it identifies with me, I go, me too, me too, me too, me too. Like I hear, I identify with, almost without exception, every time a man shares, there's something about a sharing that is in me too. And this is the beauty, I think, of a men's group. Is that we, 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 come, we, we can be strangers that come together, but we share what it's like to be a man. And, and, and it, you know, we've all had, we come from different cultures and different upbringings, but there's a, it's a shared experience. So to have the company, the fellowship of men, and know that you belong here. You may feel isolated and your experience has been different, but there's a shared experience that we all heal when we're, when we're together. I get, I mean, I, I came to the um, awareness of how healing that group was for me on Saturday. I was so high that evening, like I was, I was exhausted, but so full of humanity. Um, and it carried, it carried over for days. And then I had a contraction and I could feel myself like tightening up again. But it filled me and it felt as if I've been, I've, I, I get recharged like a battery does. And I know that I'm in the right place. I'm with men. Like, I'm a man. I'm with men. I am a man. And we share so, something so common. Um, I feel validated. And, and um, I think we support each other just by showing up. Even if you don't say much, just being in the circle is, is, is as integral to, to speaking or having process. And this, I think... It's just, it's a natural way for us to heal. And we lack that with, you know, having rituals to make, we don't ritualize. I, I had almost zero ritualization in my life, like coming of age or, I, it was more like you get your driver's license, you know, old enough to drink and you can vote. Welcome, you're a man. And I remember struggling at that, going, what does it mean now? Like, I just had a birthday, but I'm the same, you know? No elder has taken me and said, welcome to the tribe. You know, you have some responsibilities here and you also have, you know, life ahead of you to whatever. No one, I wasn't given that guidance. I think a men's group does that as well, but doing this project just filled me with so much hope. This work is important and it's important to do it in whatever way, whatever way is suitable for you. Wilhelm Reich, who was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud, came up with, you know, like his observations uh, identified that there's five, five distinct times in our life where we can become wounded in our, in our development. And in each of these, in each, in each of these um, ages, it's an age, an age where it happens, a certain, um, the, the wounding is, is specific a certain way at a certain age, and it informs you about life and, and, uh, so you, you, can, you literally become armored and energetically. You can armor yourself in your posture. That's why you can read a body. 
you can look at a body structure and see where the wounding happened by the way the, sh the head is held, the shoulders are, the, how deep they breathe, their stance in life. So you can read a body and, and then the nature of the work is to, is, to go, is to really get in tune with your feelings. What are you feeling? And what would make you safe to be able to express that fully? And, you know, and so you, you, you just follow that. You follow, you make, you're always inquiring. Where in your body do you feel tense? What does it mean? Is there a sound you could make? What's your earliest memory of that? What if you were to go into that, that expression and have full expression? Have the tantrum. You're three, three years old and you, and you couldn't get that cereal in the store and you wanted to melt down, but you know you couldn't because you'd be slapped. So you, you held it in. Have, your, have it now. Have that need. Feel the want. Feel the desire. Feel how much you couldn't. You wanted it. Like the most, you know, the most, the most you've ever wanted thing in your life and you, and you couldn't, you weren't allowed to express it. Well, express it now and free yourself up. It, essentially, when we become wounded, we block it. We block our life flow. We block our essence from blossoming. So let's unblock it. Now, without uh, breaching confidentiality, uh, in the two workshops that you've done that I was part of, can you think of things that work, worked very well in doing precisely that. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the uh, um, one of my talents is I'm a drummer, and I wanted to bring drumming into the. It's it's another way of of getting the collective energy to move and to engage people. So um, I, f I found that when we drummed, the energy changed significantly. I could look around the room and see people really engaged. And that wouldn't happen if they weren't feeling safe and playful. So that brings a whole new level of, of uh, possibilities when people are engaged in that way. Um, and it's difficult to, I, like I don't, I'm not gonna name people, but, um, uh, for people to explore, what surprised me is some men were very clear when they came in and checked in. They said, I want to work on this today. I, I came here with this. That was a first for me. Usually people don't quite know where, they're, where they want to go, but some, they had a very specific idea. And to be able to come in with the enthusiasm of wanting to work on, I'll just say, anger. Um, the intention was there, the intention was set, that I have anger. I want to work on it. I want to explore it. I'm curious. It 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 it, it maybe if I don't do so, it inhibits me some way in life. If I because I'm always having to to keep a lid on it. So to have a man, you know, want to ex express that. Um, I just, I'm hopeful now. So some of the tools we have are are. Uh, probably the, the most, the largest thing we have is a large foam cube. And we used to use a tennis racket or a batonga or a bat and just allow a man to, to just hit, to just see what that's like and almost begin in a playful way. It's as if we're just, we're eight years old and we're in a playground, we just, we just see what kind of sound I could make. And um, this technique was developed because actually when, when you, when you, when you, um, can fully get your hands over your head and and exert some strength down on, on an, you can use your voice you loosen up a lot of body structure here a lot of the armoring that is held in the abdomen and the, the, the ribs and the, the musculature there gets loosened up and opened up more sound can come up and the energy can begin to flow and as the energy begins to flow you begin to begin to follow it sometimes men get much more angry and they begin using their voices, and then if they can still feel the safety when they're doing that, they can start adding words to it. And usually the words will name something. You can name, you know, they'll, they'll be get, they, get, they may get more specific, or they may not know what they're talking about. And, that just fall, and you just follow it. And it's, being, it's always just being curious to see where is this gonna lead, and what's behind that? What's behind the, okay, so you've just had this, who is it? Who, who are you saying those words, words to? You know, whether you can, if you, you can ad identify that, then you can take, can take you back to a point in time. And you could really examine it. You could really 
get curious, opened it up and be much more specific. Like, how old were you? What did it feel like? What did you want to say back then? Why was it dangerous to say that? Well, you can have it now. And so you just get to have that full expression and relieve some of the pressure, so to speak. So, it, so I mean, I don't, I know yes specifically. It, it, that's one way it can look like. It could also um, be where you are feeding sadness. And you just, you know, even, I mean, I've had this happen where, um, a, a man talked about um, some imagery that he'd seen when he was younger that he felt was very shocking. Um, and then the group began to open up around that too. Everyone almost had their own story about, yeah, I saw something that was really terrifying and I, I didn't sleep for nights and I still ha it still haunts me, it still haunts me to this day. Um, and so I really, I really got a sense of the trauma that was there. And so um, this was new for me. It was delightful that someone had the courage to th talk about something that happened back then. Other men shared similar but different details and here we were, a collection of men who were all sharing some sort that we were impacted deeply. And it still haunted us to this day. So now we weren't, now we weren't alone. I, sleep, I still sleep with the lights on, some men said. Great, no shame. I'm a grown ass man and I sleep with the lights on because I still think, I, occasionally I think about that and it terrifies me still. So we can go, if, we, if uh, a man's willing, to, well, let's explore that. Like have your terror right here and know that you're safe and that we're going to support you and the ghosts do not exist, but have that. Get that out of your body. The relationship that men have with anger, mm -hmm. men specifically, it's multifaceted. It feels good, but it's also could be a result of, you know, feeling threatened. Mm -hmm. This is kind of your your specialty, I think. Why well, it's the specialty of the work itself, yeah. Yeah. So let's see if we can bring some clarity in this uh, strange relationship men have with anger. Mm -hmm. Well, generally we've been told as young boys that it's not appropriate. You know. Certainly not appropriate to hurt somebody with your anger, whether you hit them with a stick or you slug them or you, you, know, you push them down. Um, and then as we get older, it's against the law. I mean, it's, it's assault, right? Causing physically, physical harm. But sometimes even just expressing the words to someone, you know. Uh, I mean, people, you can be, you can be the, the police could be called. Right, for uttering a threat. Mm -hmm. right. So, if we don't do anything with it, that charge is still there, that energy is still blocked. So I find, I find, I find in, in myself it, uh, the, that anger is the first door for me. If I, could, if I could get at the anger and have my release, have my expression of it, and let go of it, I allow the next emotion to rise. Uh, and for me, it's usually heartbreak. I'm angry because I don't want to feel the heartbreak. And I'm not going to show you because it's not safe to show you. So I will remain angry. And the anger for me is frustration. I'm frustrated. I can't, you know, I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. I have heartbreak. And uh, if I don't, you know, and, and that pressure can build. I can just, I can feel the resentfulness of it. You know, the anger, if it doesn't get channeled in a healthy way, I think it will turn into cancer or an ulcer or um, a binge, you know, like uh, control, loss, loss of, you know, being able to control my appetite and like, never feeling satiated because mm -hmm. I'm trying to push it down and trying to push it down. I think it takes a ton of effort to suppress something rather than let it go. But everything you've said so far could apply to both men and women. It could. So what is it specifically about men and anger? It, it's, it's got a bad rap in society. You know, it belongs on the football field or the hockey rink, but it doesn't belong, you know, or uh, the abusive father who beats his children, you know. Um, I'd love to see young 
young families or a mother with a young child, when her, when her son is angry, to not say, stop that, bad boy, wait till your dad gets home. You will not do that again to your sister. To say, oh, oh, she's really upset you. Come, let's go and like, tell me about it. How does it feel? That's, that's terrible. I'm sorry it happened to you. Like, allow, uh, honor that, that reaction. It's personal inner work that contributes to that. I think you don't come to a men's group and, and it isn't done for you. I think you have to come with an intention to look within. Look within it yourself. And take responsibility. Ask for help. Ask for guidance. Risk. How do you find out whether an inhibition is nature or nurture? So by nature and nurture, you mean that you were born with this and there's nothing, that's just, it's just the biology, right? You're born with, with missing your arms, right? I don't know the answer to that. It's really self-inquiry. Well, missing arms is, is, you know, I've, that's, that's a very uh, concrete uh, thing that you're missing. Mm. You know, and that's obvious, that's, well, you probably remember whether that, that was an accident or whether that was by birth. But if you're, if you're very shy, right. then, you, you know, some people probably are born with social anxiety right. and others will have. I get it. Yeah, I get, so I get, I get the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, another thing to, that I think is important here is um, the family history. Um, I mean, the, the, the new study of ep epigenetics they really points to we are carrying genetically emotionality. Um, so if you know if our if anyone is your family was a Jew who's been through a, a concentration camp, you can't help but be impacted by that. Uh, even the culture, um, you know, that these people have been oppressed for centuries, and you're going to have that in your in your psyche, in your, in your DNA. Um, there's a fellow in LA who does, um, or from Hawaii who visits LA, who does like healing our ancestral past. And he looks at, you know, we are carrying this energetic sense of ourselves that is, that is not conscious, but is, is, um, uh, has impact. So we may, we may honestly come into a, a world if we're born you know, you name any culture, name any color, that's going to have its flavor attached to it. Its oppressions, the famines they've gone through, you know, the, the, uh, the horrors of war and famine and uh, colonialism, that all impacts is there. And, if, and, and I think that it's there, if you can bring consciousness to it, you can work with it. You can actually, be, you know, if you can name it and claim it, then it, it, you make it an entity to be worked with. You know, uh, and you can even speak in terms of why do my peoples, you know, my people have this belief? Why is that? You know, what is in my my in my blood right now that it, that still carries that? And I think I think I think healing can happen there. Although we don't know the whether it's attainable, maybe just as a thought experiment, what would man look like when he ha once he has healed everything? I don't know. Is that what we call enlightenment? What does someone do with, with his days? Besides just the basic necessities? I don't know. I think if you, I think if, I think your life purpose will become much more clear if you can rid yourselves of the, um, maybe the, our wrong thinking that we have about ourselves. So we can maybe could be of service. Do you have uh, an idea of what you're going to work on the next 20 years? I'm at a, uh, a chapter change right now in my life. And um, I'm just entering, as I finish my schooling, I'm, I'm going to be entering sort of a much more blank slate than I've ever had for quite some time. So I'm planning a move 
and that move itself will facilitate a new community for me. I can build something from scratch. I'm looking forward to doing that. Uh, and I'm looking forward to being more expressive, like musically and artistically. So I'm entering more of a creative. And I have a more um, self-awareness of my worth and my gifts. And what a friend told me, so you've got medicine. You've got medicine. Take your medicine out to the world. And I struggle with, with even using the, those, those words because there's something, there's a, um, a sense of um, um, aloofness, you know, and it's not that. It's like I do have a gift. And if I can get, get by the shame of claiming it, then I can actually celebrate it and share it. And, you talked earlier about your gift of being a musician as well. Um, is, is, is it helpful to have a healthy dose of creativity when working on yourself, being in a men's group, doing your therapy farm? I think so. I think, it, well, for me, it's, uh, uh, I, I, I'm going to stop, I, I would stop to say it's essential because I don't think it's essential, but I think it adds so much more um, the possibilities. And this is what I've learned doing the work, that it, you can take it into the world in the way that it's going to work for you. It isn't, it isn't a very rigid system. There are people who are graduating from radical aliveness who are doing, um, uh, or actors, and they're taking this work into their acting to, for them to be able to access their feelings. There are, are people working with uh, people of color in third world countries, there's traditional therapists who are bringing a cube and a racket into their offices so that patients uh, can go beyond talk therapy. And when they're ready to express, they, they just allow them to do that. And, uh, and that generally, it just speeds things up. What about uh, a talent for humor? Absolutely. How? I think that you can you, you can get insights um, and perspectives, and I think it's what comedians are always. It's, this is what makes good comedians is they they can find a unique angle, and perspective to share and see the humor in that. So I think it it, it opens it opens things up, and I think um, I've thought so rigidly. I've thought my thoughts. Um, speaking of barn doors, like as far as controlling the light, I, I think I, I had a very narrow perspective. And the barn door has been able to open and more of my light's been able to shine out into the world. That's been my analogy. I understand the last part and I understand the part about humor, but I don't see the connection. Yeah, I probably wasn't connecting the two. Okay. Is there a connection? I have been able to laugh at things that I never would have been able to he laugh at before. And, and, I, and, and um, it's... Really, when I can, when I will not, when I can stop thinking, getting out of one he one hemisphere of the brain into another, when I when I don't have to be analytical, and I can see sometimes I see the folly of my life, like why I have given um, importance to something, which I will I will scratch my head and go, wow, why was I thinking that was important? Yeah. So, by being able to laugh at things now that you weren't able to laugh at before, is that also that lid that we talked about, that anger sits on top of things and doesn't allow the liveness, aliveness to come out? Yes, yeah, that's one. And I find that, that um, I'm always opening, and like I, it's an it's a, it's a opening, it's an expansion and a contraction. So when things open up for you, you, you see, to tend to, I mean, uh, um, some people find that doing psychedelics, they, get, they, o they open up and see much more or experience a sense of much more. I feel the same way with this work, is that um, when I can allow myself to have full expression, something, is mo something moves and allows for more, like just there's more awareness in a, in a bigger picture as it comes. And then that itself contracts again and I get, you know, it's kind of like an ongoing expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. 
You've seen me lead uh, men's groups, uh, but I don't have your training. But uh, what can I do to somehow make more room for men to express their anger? Or anything else? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, it, I think every experience we have in the men's group um, that we remember and see value in it. We put, we put that in our back pocket as a card. And I think, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think you, you may be doing this already, just taking some elements, not just in what you've seen me do, but with other people and being able to apply that. To not have it, not it be static, but always evolving. Um, I've seen how you've opened up, like how you welcome, like you... Uh, Structure a meeting where it doesn't get stuck. You set a time limit and then you move on and you invite another. So if someone's sitting there frustrated, that's going to end and they're going to have time to come in and have their say. I think that's important to keep it flowing. But to also that if it gets stuck, if the energy gets stagnant or stuck, to not necessarily move from that too quickly, but to say, well, what's happening here? There's a lull. The energy's kind of dropped. What's going on? Just always being, always inquire and don't, don't think anything is insignificant because there's always, I find there's always a gift there. If you, if you, if you can make inquiry, solicit the group, find out what's going on. Maybe a man just has got a relative who's not doing well and his silence is manifesting in the group just kind of slowing down because there's a, there's a weight there. Make inquiry. We've both uh, witnessed resentments within the groups. What's the right way to deal with that? To not let it go underground. Mm -hmm. To be able to fully, um, to, to name it so that it can be seen as what, as what it is. If it's not named, it's hidden, it's hidden energy that uh, has an effect on the group. So name it, put it in the open, allow everyone to have a say with it, and then begin to dissect it. What, what, what typically happens is people will go to blame. I did that in, in the first group. You know, the, the, reason, <clears throat> the reason why I left, in my mind, was because of a man. But what I wasn't looking at is my responsibility there. Why didn't I say something sooner? And, and in hindsight, I look about he represented authority to me. And I've always have felt less, yeah, I always felt that he, there was a power differential there because of how long he'd been in the group and his experience that I honored because there was wisdom there. He wasn't, he, but also it locked, it locked my relationship with him because he had more experience and, and duration in the group. I entered the group when he was there. So therefore I, you know, I honor people's time, but I wasn't advocating enough for myself. I did, I did in certain ways, and, and, and I would get a nonverbal answer back that, you know, we have to vote on this. We have to, we have to all agree to, to have a change happen. And I realized it's, it was kind of clunky. What would you rather have done differently? I probably would have um, been more vocal earlier, and I would have asked. I would have asked questions. I, I mean, I, I wasn't completely silent. I would challenge the group time and time again when I asked the question: Are we talking about feelings, or are we supposed to have feelings? And well, if we could have feelings, but no one else brought feelings. But when I had the training, and I had at least something I could bring the group where we can engage. Um, I felt, well, this was a step in the right direction. But because of the shared leadership and the history of the group, I had four, four men over here one evening, early, you know, two, over two years ago, and they all ate up the hitting. They loved it. I've seen them, like, I'd never seen them before in the years previously. They came to life. Yeah. The following week, they shared about how much they loved the experience but we're completely content to, to go back to the talking stick and wait another 
two months before I led again, and if I chose to lead that way. And I got, it got frustrating. Because I, I didn't think there was an appetite for it, really. I think it was a one-off. Or maybe, the, I'm not sure if, if, there was, if they felt challenged, it was too far out of the comfort zone, if the container at the church wasn't able to hold that kind of energy, and it probably wasn't. I'd like to go back a little bit more to the resentment, because you and I have had a conversation about this before, and my, my own choice was to not make enemies. Mm -hmm. And you encouraged me to, to speak up, to express anger. Um, I'm still not sure whether I did the right thing or not by keeping my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to just create a very uncomfortable feeling there. Mm -hmm. And there was fear that it wasn't going to be a productive conversation. I mean, it, it's, it's some, in some situations, it, it might be better, I think, to to not try to work things out. Hmm. What I've learned is the growth happens in the discomfort. It's, it's not easy and it's not comfortable and it can feel really threatening. And it may feel like the end of, you know, it may feel like the end of, like you don't wanna, you don't wanna end this way. But the work, the, work that we're, the work that I do is all about that. And that's what makes it difficult. It's really stepping out of what we call the edge, like, like Where's your edge here? How far, would you, how far would you raise your voice and say what you need to say? That not, and then the next step is now bordering on being unkind or, or you know, a bully or whatever, or, or just being misunderstood. But it's, it's, um, I've learned is that when you withhold, you're just withholding yourself from being fully present in the group. And that to really step in and, and to claim for yourself. That's when I think the biggest shifts happen, is when you can create a container so, men, so anyone, not men or women, can come and really speak their truth. Even if it's like completely social, um, um, politically not incorrect, sexist, racist, you know, um, like if it's, if, it's, if, it's in, if, it's, if it's within you, um, you know, our filters protect, protect us because we, we have a reputation, our families have reputations, we, we maybe, our job might depend on it, our livelihood. So, um, so we withhold. There's, there's a lot of societal pressures around that. But the healing will happen when, I've seen it, where, where people would, you know, um, in mixed groups, people declaring their attraction for other people, their sexuality for other people. You know, they, they, they're straight up about it. But it's held. That's here. Why would we deny it? Like, it's here. It may be uncomfortable, and it's probably uh, make people uncomfortable that it's being spoken to, but you're claiming your full personhood in the room. This is what's up for me. But in the case of resentment, the person that you're resentful towards right. might feel excluded from the group, might feel... They might. They might. Yeah. So, so, what, so I think if you um, contextualize it, by saying to the person, I feel mad when you do that because it reminds me of my grade four teacher who shamed me and I hate you for it. So you're claiming the origin of it. When you, when you, when you said those words to me last week, I was really hurt. So my my, uh, I will conclude, I hate you for that. You make me feel something. Now I have to look at the feeling in me. What is the genesis of that feeling? Because you remind me of the grade four teacher who shamed me. You are benign actually. But something about you as an energetic quality, what you said, the look you gave me, the color of socks you're wearing, remind me of something that makes me hot, really uncomfortable. And therefore I want to blame you for my discomfort. Now I will take self-responsibility and say, when you said that to me, I felt hurt. I also felt four years old again. So I want to, I want to check reality. Did you, did you mean to hurt me? Or is that just, is that a phrase you use and I misinterpreted it? Could we get clear on it? 
You know, because if you meant to hurt me, I'm fucking done with you. I'm out of here. But I have a young, I have a trigger in me and you're, you're pushing on this really sensitive spot. So I want to just be clear here. Okay. And so if you can have that conversation, you can thank them for aggr aggravating you because if you're willing to follow it back to its origin, you're just realizing it's, it's, it, the wound is there. They've just pushed it unknowingly. Okay, the wound is there and it was an old wound. Yeah. You're not, you're saying you are not the problem, but it's right. somehow, but what if they really are the problem? So, uh, so, give, so give me an example. Someone is just generally a jerk. Uh, or someone is um, just being offensive, being... Right, right. So, do, so um, like Donald Trump? I don't know, I mean... I don't know Donald Trump. Okay. Um, and we're not in a men's group with Donald Trump. Right, right, right. No, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to get a sense of the, of, of the, um, someone is just a jerk. Um, Or I can't stand you. I, th I think there's great wisdom. Anytime an emotion like that comes, yeah, I can't stand you. I can't stand being with you. You're too demanding. You, you, you want too much of me. That is an opening into, into, like, into healing. But you've got to be able to tolerate the, the, like whatever, it, whatever it is to, to be able to say it, the embarrassment, the humiliation. You have to be able to tolerate that when I think, it, I think our first reaction is, when we've, been, when we've been wounded emotionally, is to get away from the hot stove, right? No way, no way, I'm gone, and you're a bad person, and I'm never gonna see you again. That's the way to end it, but it doesn't clear it up. I think you've gotta stay engaged, and would you be willing to explore this with me? I fucking hate you. Everything you've said to me, it hurts. But I know it's, but I wanna, I wanna make sure it's not you being a jerk. I wanna make sure that, because I, because. What the, you know, uh, 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 context to say, what's your earliest memory of that, of that feeling? And 99% of the time, it's, it's when I was blank years old and somebody yelled, you know, it, there, it's an old wound that is just being re-triggered. And you are doing this to me. And, and I have had conflict with people where, um, you just want them to die and get like no, no longer exist in the world because they're so, they, they, they trigger so much in you where I thank them profusely for the gift they gave me because they were willing to, to um, spar with me and figure this out with kindness, you know, and sometimes a mediator is required. Sometimes a therapist is there to say, tell me all the things he reminds you of or she reminds you of. Let's really explore this. Let's really explore this. And it's, it's just history. It's history and it can go back. To be, to be very young. Yeah, the, the documentary is, well, basically, I, I have a feeling this is an important subject to cover. Men's, men's work, men in groups, um, the, the, the changing of dynamics in generation of men. And, but yeah, really, this, the focus is still very broad. I'm just grasping at threads of information to to find out where to go with this this very valuable sh subject, and and maybe you know maybe there might need to be separate um, even uh, you know productions to explore different aspects of it because I realize it's a very uh, large topic. But I would ask you what yeah what pertinent subjects or topics or questions are you interested in or do you think are, are valuable to explore in this well I, you know I think that um, uh, a great resource is Tristan because he you know he's been involved with the summit right there is a history that goes back to the well, as far as we know probably the early 80, mid 80s uh, with men, men's groups so using the summit and the men who showed up there and the reason for having a summit and the diversity of the men's groups that's going on here. I mean, that in itself, you don't even have to travel to around the world to, to, to get other people's thing. They say, what is happening in this microcosm of Vancouver mm -hmm. that, had, that, that has you know, a 30 year history of, or, or 40 year history of, of sort of men's work? Um, uh, it's, a, it, you know, it's a dynamic city, it's growing, it's changing, it's culturally changing. Like, 
what is it? And yet, what are we? Are we like 0.002% of the population? I mean, I mean, how many men actually are? Are there numbers? Are there 140 men in the Lower Mainland who are actively in men's groups? Or are there 3,000? I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, and get a sense of um, Vancouver, British Columbia, you know, the universe, the war, you know, Vancouver and what's happening here as compared to what's happening in New York City, in LA, in Ottawa. I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think there's one that you, you can define it, mm-hmm. you know, because it's, 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 it's part of each man's personal growth and then it's their masculinity and their as males mm-hmm. in society. And um, a part of me thinks that men doing men work, and I'm just going to be a real opinionated guy, that there's something, I, I don't say more evolved, but there's a curiosity rather than just drinking beer and watching hockey mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, going, going to the monster truck rallies and dirt bike riding. I think there's more, there's a, there's a sensitivity and, and awareness of men wanting community, men wanting to find their place in the world and how to be a man because society defines us. So, you know, there's so many, we have so many pressures on us as men mm-hmm. to be, to be, you know, the warriors of the family, you know, the, the provider, the um, uh, you know to, to clothe and feed and house our you know our part our, our families uh, and to be in the concrete jungle and make a living and and all the pressures that are on us and then our histories so I mean it's it's so vast that I mean I it, it, I'd be surprised if if there was much correlation between I mean I'm sure there's different flavors and the culture of I mean the people that are in my school are from Mexico and. Uh, like South America and Europe and I mean just everywhere and they're taking this work back into their cultures and it's, it's going to look different mm-hmm. the radical liveness is going to look different in Norway than it will in Japan than it will in in Chile so it's it's um I don't know how do you but but I'm I, I want to ask you is I saw the spark in you at the summit like you told me you were good I'm a filmmaker and I'm going to make a film so tell me about the spark um, well, something that's coming to me right now as you're talking was just, I, I think, I guess from my personal experience, I'm feeling there's so little structure or support in becoming a man. Kind of like you mentioned, well, like, okay, I got my driver's license and I can vote, but like, what else, you know? And, and it's kind of like, I feel like we're just sort of, you know, just thrown out in the world. And, and you know, I mean, I mean, my experience and my father was, you know, not much better off than I was just like, I don't know, figure it out, like kind of drifting around. and. And I feel like that hasn't been like that in, in history past. I feel like there was a lot more structure, like, you know, trades and responsibilities and stuff handed down through generations. Um, and maybe it, it's also related to, like, spirituality and religion. Maybe there was a lot more structure for men in their roles and expectations in culture where, where religion was a, a big factor. And I feel like maybe we're in a day and an age now where sp- so many people are losing touch or respect for religious or spiritual practices, and so maybe this this sense of feeling lost, uh, you know, not feeling structure as a man is connected to I don't know being agnostic or you know it's probably several factors that are leading up to it. But I guess what I really would like to gain out of this process of of interviewing and making a documentary is to to kind of look at maybe what in history has been lost so that that has added up to us being where we are and feeling this sense of of lack of support and what steps can we do to to improve that or even maybe you know I'd like for myself to be able to be able to you know gain the the necessary information or experience or wisdom so that you know my son or or, you know men of the younger generations i could be able to provide some sense of of structure or guidance or initiation for them and yeah so like what are those elements that really make us feel you know that we are 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 grown or are are adults rather than just the the external sort of physical things of getting a house and a car and that kind of stuff like what is it in the inner world that that makes us feel that that groundedness in our in our masculinity in, in a mature way rather than like a maybe in an insecure kind of aggressive way mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any thoughts on those well I mean being a man um, 
there's a lot, there's a lot of bad raps that go on being a man. I mean, we are mm-hmm. rapists. I mean, we we you know we we're the ones who rape. Mm-hmm. We're the ones who uh, you know the misogyny of our culture. I mean, women just got the voting right. I mean, you know, that, that, that's, still, that's still very much, even in your generation, like there's a reverberation of how patriarchal our society is. Mm-hmm. You know, look at the people running for president. This is the, this will be the first woman in since the beginning of the U.S. I mean, it's like, that's astounding, like that, how much inequality is. And I think being born with a penis, you know, there's a lot of guilt there. There's a lot of guilt just be, be by the nature of history and how men are, 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 men are the warriors and, and they oppress. Mm-hmm. Religions are really oppressive, you know, because certain, certain religions are very oppressive and, and they're male dominated, you know, the supreme leaders of the world, right? So, so I think that we, uh, we you know, to um, celebrate our goodness as men, that men are not all asshole warriors, br- brutal rapists and killers, that we can be tender and have our feminine side. And in fact, one of the woundings that happen for people is when, uh, when um, the son turns a certain age and he, wants, he still wants to hop on daddy's knee. And, you know, we adore our parents. They, are, they have given us life and we just see them. And that's where the nurturance, the love, the clean bedding, the Christmas gifts, all that good stuff comes from. And we love them, but they get busy in life. And at some point, society kind of says, and a lot of terrible self-help parent books says, you know, you cut them off at that, at that age, they, they do not let them, you know, do not give them the attention or the love because they've got to grow and be independent. They've got to sleep in their own room. They've got to, you know, it's like we, we believe the experts rather than, uh, than ourselves. So when a, when a young boy, daddy comes home, daddy, daddy, I want to just be with you. I want to just like, you're, I, want to, I want closeness and, and comfort and I love you. And the father is just overworked and, and realized, oh, you know, you're just too big now. So you get pushed away. And that's a wound. A young daughter who, who wants just to be with daddy. And uh, the father can mistake it for sexuality. That there's a sexual thing that, you know, there's kind of weird, the male, female, the young girl. No, honey, you know, get off me now. It's not. And all she wants is just daddy's attention. She becomes wounded. She, she becomes like, what, what's wrong with me? Why don't you love me? Why, why can't I just, why can't we get close? So uh, we struggle with that. You know, we all have, we all get wounded. Right, and in that kind of situation, my understanding is that comes from the father not really doing his own work with his sexuality or maybe, I don't know, his relationship with his mother or something. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like you were talking about, you know, we may have a you know, woman president coming up, like there's, there's been a lot in the, in the gender dynamics has been changing. Um, but I think maybe something that I've seen a lot in, in sort of my, my generation is that is, is going to the other extreme, like maybe is, is repressing the, the anger and be like, oh, I've got to be all nice and feminine and lovey. But then that becomes a big problem. I find that, that women in my life, you know, are maybe don't like respect that or are really yearning to see that, that stronger masculine part that is like claiming and in a way being like a, being a strong leader or I mean somewhat dominating. But it's, it's, I guess it's a very delicate balance of doing that with, with I guess, a strong connection to that, that emotionality or that, that love, that respect, but still claiming that, yes. that strength. And that struggle, I think, is pretty universal. Mm-hmm. We struggle. Like, what do our women want? Do we you know, we'll read the self-help books or, you know, how to be a man to your woman or whatever, whatever the title is going to be. Yeah. Um, and we have to navigate that stuff. You know, I, I, I want to be like, I love you. I want to support you. I want to I honor you and I, I want to respect you. Yet she wants maybe sex to be a bit rougher, or she wants you know more of your more of your dom- domination in the relationship, you know. And how do we? Because there's so, so, a lot of mixed signals we get, right? Mm-hmm. It's really, it's really fine. I think it's really tricky, and I think I don't think there is one 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 answer. But the, but there's all the all the pressure to try and understand it and you know be the best man we could be while while not losing ourselves in what's expected of us. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I really appreciate about your, your workshop and, and that kind of work and is, is creating a space for, I guess, all of our feelings. Like, I think we get so many messages early on in our life that, oh, that's not acceptable and shouldn't behave like this and shouldn't behave like that. And that, all that stifles our life force or our you know, natural or true nature or personality and becomes these layers that we then just become these kind of time bombs, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so it's... I think maybe that's a really valuable thing that I've experienced in men's circles and in work like you're, you're doing is, is just how 
to yeah to accept ourselves with all of our, our emotions and not label any of it as good or bad or unwelcome and I think so many of us have a hard time doing that in ourselves no matter how much work we do but there's something that happens when other people around us can can welcome or accept that mm -hmm. yeah. and um, yeah and I, and I guess that's something that I would really like to even demonstrate in this documentary you know even even if I can just get the message out there like to, to men who don't even are familiar with what what a men's circle is or why men go to it the guys who are you know just maybe they're used to just drinking beer and talking about hockey all the time but I'm sure there's something underneath them that is yearning for a bit more meaningful conversation and so if this little mm -hmm. film project can can just go like well it you know it's not just for you know it's not it's not necessarily just therapy but it, it can be a combination of that that fellowship or that friendship that you seek at the bar mm -hmm. but with another level of just acceptance for a, a broader spectrum of your your expression and um yeah see I, so what just popped for me is is um and what you said was like yeah can we create a forum where we could have space so we can really show up so so who shows up our lover our killer our judger like all the traits all the things that we, we've been that we've been informed is like mm, that's not good no 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 i don't want to see that no but if we have that in us the tantrums we never we weren't been able to have you know our disgust with whatever you know even our parents our sexual um uh fantasies or or like like sh sh like openly share, share this stuff so that we can a realize that that doesn't diminish our goodness we're humans and if we deny what is in us we deny our full expression in the world not to, not that you act upon things because many times i mean i have felt like there's people i've oh i've said i like i ne never said that but it's like you know i could kill you right now because you're making me feel so angry i would not kill them but to express the level mm -hmm. of my of my dis disgust with them or my, my anger at them, um, to say it, to just be able to say that, you know? When you do that to me, I want to just kill you. Because mm -hmm. I'm not killing you as a person, I'm killing the feelings, I, the, the, the feelings I'm having to endure because I associated with you. I want to just, whatever it's going to take to get rid of it. So I will just apply the kill filter and say, I want to kill you. you know? And to know that, that the humans have that, mm -hmm. we are, you know, not that we would act upon it. We want to be rational and present mind, but to but to deny that in us, you know, is not is not fully honoring who we are. We're every emotion possible. Yeah. Have you ever been part of a men's circle that is like a closed group that doesn't allow other men to come? Like just I, I haven't minutes? been a part, but I, we had a demonstration from a group that came to visit hmm. our men's group, and um, and I was really impressed. Because being a closed circle, they actually chose the members carefully. They wanted to make sure that the chemistry was there and that they were, you know, sort of all on the same page. But what I found this group did really well was like they had such a level of trust and friendship uh, and, and time together that they could challenge the hell of each other mm -hmm. and really make a man like accountable saying like, Sh you're not showing up. Mm -hmm. you're bull don't bullshit us. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you feeling right now about this? You know? And so... It was a level that's almost like, you know, men's groups on steroids. And I see where it takes the commitment of, you know, commit to show up, to be regular, and to, um, and to bring yourself fully here. And say, we do a, let's do a one-year trial, like the show for the whole year. Mm -hmm. Every Wednesday night, unless you're sick or you've got something that happens, you're going to show up and you're going to support the men and be supported at the same time. And I think, because I think what happens with men's groups that are, have an open open door policy and you know kind of men come and go um, is that it doesn't quite build the container the way that you need I think for deep deep work mm -hmm. yeah I feel like that's something I, I would really seek in a, in a group of men is just almost to make some sort of agreement that like because I, I feel like I want to discover more of my true self without all the layers of like oh it got to be polite and politically correct like you know it would be great to make an agreement that to sit at, at with a group of people and go like i want to be able to say whatever the hell i want right. and if that hurts your feelings or insults you you're not going to blame or shame me about it but you're going to acknowledge it and, and express right. your feeling for right. you but not not twist it and be manipulative about sure. it so the thing so as as a man in that group that you may say 
Um, we all know that whatever's, whatever's going to come at us is not about us. Mm -hmm. We're just a trigger. So yeah, bring it. Tell me how much you hate me. Tell me how much I've ruined your life. Tell me how much I'm an asshole I am. Like, give me the full blame. Because right now, I'm going to stand here for you. I'm going to support you and you letting, you can just have at me. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you need to grab some boxing gloves and a blocker, so we'll get be safe here. Punch the, punch the fuck out of me. Like, take me down. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in the work that we do, um, people will actually have a session where they will kill somebody. Like, with a, with, with a blocker and a thing, and they will just pound. And the room is supported, and people know their limits. Um, no one's hurt physically, but... Mm -hmm. You roll on, you know, you, you start, and you can do a lot of pillows and blankets, and you can really have that full rage and aggression where no one's being hurt, but you're, you're allowing the energy to flow. Mm -hmm. And you're not denying it. And your goodness isn't diminished. In fact, the love for you increases when you, can, when you show up with your full humanity. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. It's a, it's a bit of an um, oxymoron. Like, man, if they see this in me, they're going to never want to be my friend again. And but the bottom line is, you show up, what, why, why do you think what's in you isn't in the rest of us? It totally is. Mm -hmm. you know, the story would be different, but all of you, your, full, you know, your, your fullness here, what makes you think you're different from us? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I did notice that since the, the workshop with you, um, and I guess because I've gotten to a safe place in my relationship where we're both just getting comfortable in, in expressing whatever we're going through, but I noticed my, my feelings and my emotions going like, very sporadic through a much shorter time than I've really experienced much in the past to go quickly from being grumpy to being like giddy and excited and then to being sad and angry and it was just like wow what's going on but you know an old, a younger me would think hey, there's something wrong here I'm like totally unbalanced or something but I in a way it felt really good and it's like you know what I'm not stopping it it's just coming out like like and you know what it's, I think it's I appreciated that because being around kids a lot more lately, I, I say, ah, that's how kids behave. They just, they feel it, they express it, and it's gone. They drop and, it. And just yeah. so quickly. And that's, yeah, it seems like a much healthier, fluid, alive way to be rather than just holding, I'm holding on hold. to stuff with that, right. like that trunk getting very full and, yeah. and expecting the performance of the vehicle. Yeah, because yeah, it, it wasn't safe. It wasn't safe, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't safe to like show that stuff. And all we can do is, is store it. Stole it, right? Mm -hmm. it and I guess maybe that's something that in maybe more so in North American culture than others is yeah. it's hard to find those safe spaces. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, there's a few other women in our in our group in Vancouver, and they they're looking for rental spaces that are actually soundproof and they're hard to come. I mean, music studios or rehearsal spaces mm -hmm. are kind of the only way you can go, and even then they're limited to some degree. So. Um, to be able to find, you know, like this is this is for me as a real gift is invite people who don't know this work at all to say, what if you could come and have the tantrum you never got from that box of cereal back in 1982 or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, like come and really be yourself mm -hmm. without being proper and, you know, and all together. Um, and let's just see, what, let's just see what's there, you know. And I, I had this fantasy of like, in all the major shopping malls, whenever I see, I've seen a store that's close, you know, uh, cl close for business, mm -hmm. um, to just try a, a two-month experiment, go in there, build some soundproof rooms, and then charge people 10 bucks an hour to come in there, hit a cube, you know, kick a, a mannequin, or, you know, like, like to be able to have that, that full-on, and use your voice, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that would be very yeah. liberating. <laughs> Well, I'm aware we're, we're running short on time. Yeah. I really appreciate yeah. you taking this time and... and uh, well, glad to help out. I, I, I really, uh, I saw the spark at the summit and, and I really wake up with you on. If, if I can help you out in any way. Yeah, just don't lose that spark. Yeah, it's got, it's got, a, it's got a mission to, to do, so. Yeah. And yeah, I look forward to seeing what's next in your chapter and, and you know, be interested if you're offering those kind of workshops again to, uh, to learn more about that practice, uh, experience it. So, thank you, Terry. <laughs>